we are going to get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Lauren Levine. I moderate and host these webinars and have been doing that for a little over 10 years now. Um, another great turnout. Whenever Dr. Kaczynski speaks, we typically get the most people registering. We had around 900 registered for this. As always, as I've been doing for the last few years, hope that everyone's staying healthy and safe out there. Uh, kudos, as always, for you know continuing your dental education, uh, for, for attending these, these webinars. Uh, you know, you all know the value of ongoing education, which is which is why you're here. Um, I'm only going to speak for a few minutes. Uh, I want to make sure that Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he needs to. We want to leave time at the end for questions. Most of you have been on webinars in the past. If it's been a while or perhaps this is new for you, on your screen you have a little control panel, the GoToWebinar screen there, and you can just type in questions as you think about them. When we have 900 people, obviously we, we can't do verbal questions. Um, we try to get to as many questions as possible. I get to see all the questions as they're coming in. I may end up combining some together. I may, uh, you know, try to get to as, as many as we can. If I don't get to yours, I apologize ahead of time. Typically, uh, the speaker will go for about an hour. Uh, we're going to make a special offer, and and then we're going to um, open it up for Q and A. But we do want to end within 90 minutes. So by half past, uh, you know, six o'clock here, and depending what time zone you're in, uh, but usually it, that's a hard stop. So I apologize again if we don't get to, to all of your your questions. In the next few days, look for a couple of things. I record all my webinars. Uh, you will be sent a link that you can download the recording. So don't worry if you get distracted or don't make it to the end. During the webinar, uh, Dr. Kaczynski is going to show some of the products and systems that he uses, which are exclusive to Golden Dent. I've had the pleasure of working with Kurt in Golden Dent for many, many years. They're the ones that sponsor the webinars. They bring in the speakers and develop the content. Um, they're also the ones that handle the CE. I get a lot of questions about CE after the webinar. I'm going to try to mention it a few times this evening. Basic rule of thumb number one, we only can give CE if you're here live. If you're listening to this recorded, we have no way of tracking that, so you have to be here live. Number two, you have to be logged in. Uh, we've had some people that said, oh, I called in to the number, you know, I was, I was listening. That's like watching a movie with your eyes closed. <laughs> There's nothing you can, you have to be able to see what's going on there. And everyone has the same call in number. If you click the link, if you could see a screen up right now, then that means you're registered. And as long as you stay for the bulk of the webinar, usually it's like 40, 45 minutes, whatever it is, um, you will be sent a CE form. Uh, that usually takes about a week or so because I have to go through the whole list and, and see who logged in and when you logged out. Uh, there's nothing you need to do. There's no quiz, there's no registration. Uh, I send the list to Golden Dent, they go through it, and as long as you qualify, you'll get sent it. So keep an eye on your inbox. For some reason, a lot of times those end up in people's junk folders. So you know, check it uh, over the next few days. If you don't have it, say a week from today, week, you know, uh, maybe a week from Wednesday, by all means, feel free to reach out to me and I'll follow up uh, with them uh, as well. Part of the reason that we also love working with Golden Dent is they'll typically make a special offer. Uh, Kurt from uh, Golden Dent will come on at the end of the presentation before we go to the Q&A uh, to go over that as well. So with that out of the way, uh, many of you are here because of Tim Kaczynski. You all probably know who he is. I will give you a short, uh, that's sarcastically, by the way, a short bio of, of him. Uh, if we actually, if I listed all of his accomplishments, we, we wouldn't have time for the rest of the presentation. Uh, Reader's Digest version is he's an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He's on the editorial review board of Reality. Uh, many of you know that uh, magazine. He is the past editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He's the, currently the editor of the AGD Journal of General Dentistry and AGD Impact, Impact. He was recently named editor of Implants Today, which is part of Dentistry Today. He's past president of the Mission Academy of General Dentistry. He is a practicing dentist. He's got a DDS from University of Detroit Mercy Dental School. He has a mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry. 
uh, ICOI and the American Society of Osteointegration. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and got his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, he's received many honors, uh, including fellowship in the American and Interna International College of Dentists, the Academy of Dentists International. Uh, 2017, he received the Academy of Dentistry's International Humanitarian Award in recognition of significant contributions to the enhancement of the quality of life in the human condition. He's a member of OKU, uh, Pierre Fouchard Academy. He was a University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry Alumni Association's Alumnus of the Year. Uh, and in 2009, 2014, and 2020, he got the Academy of General Dentistry's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. He told me that he, today, I think, he placed his 18,000th implant, which is amazing. Uh, he's got hundreds of articles, about 230, 240 records on surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry. Uh, if you read the textbook, Principles and Practices of Implant Dentistry, you've seen his, his work there, um, as well as dental implantation and technology. Tim, I, I think you kind of know what you're talking about, so we're thrilled to have you here and looking forward to the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. You always make me giggle when you introduce me. Um, I try. So we're done for tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed the program. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for, for, for sharing part of your evening with me. Um, this is an important topic uh, to me, the immediate dental implant Dental implants have become a, a prominent part of, of many of our, our practices. And as a general dentist, I'm a big advocate of general dentists becoming proficient and efficient in treating patients. You know, Lauren, we all know that our, our patients today uh, are coming into our office specifically asking about dental implants. If, if they're having problems uh, in their mouth, they're missing a tooth, they broke a tooth, they're wearing a partial denture, that they're unhappy with, they're going to Google search it, and what's going to come up is is dental implants, and so they come to our practices with specific information, which may or may not be 100% accurate. So I think it's our duty, um, uh, our duty as professionals, to educate ourselves um, on the benefits uh, and risks of of dental implants, but. Oftentimes, especially in the age of COVID, Lauren, I don't think I've ever seen so many broken teeth, root canal treated teeth that have fractured where patients are coming in wanting um, a permanent replacement, so to speak. So I think it's imperative that th those in the audience today and, our, and our, our colleagues really understand the importance of what I like to call atraumatic extractions. We, we coined that term many, many years ago now, and, and I've been criticized for that term many times a traumatic what what does that mean um and basically what it means is is minimally traumatic to the surrounding bone um, bone to me for those of you who heard me before bone is gold um maintaining as much natural natural bone uh, i think is very very important for long-term success as as you've said lauren i've been doing this a long time since 1985 uh, and we've placed a lot of implants and, and we've seen a lot of transitions over the years. So maintaining, maintaining bone, doing the minim, minimally invasive, uh, minimally traumatic extraction to the bone and obviously giving the patient a positive experience. You know, moving teeth is, is stressful for people. And um, uh, many of our techniques, our, 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 our conventional techniques are challenging both to the doctor and to the patient. So we're gonna go through some of the extraction techniques that we use that are very, very important. Um, I'm a big believer if we're gonna remove a tooth, we know physiologically that, that bone is gonna be lost. It's going to shrink up and in in the, in the upper jaw, down and in in the lower jaw. And many of us don't place dental implants because of the loss of bone. We're afraid of the sinus area in the maxillary posterior area. We're concerned with the um, submandibular nerve uh, in the lower jaw and the posterior maxilla, mandible. So, you know, it's important that not only do we know how to extract, but how to build that bone. And I oftentimes say in my lectures that um, we can teach you how to grow bone uh, in a socket and with a facial defect. And that's what I wanna leave you with today. But it's not a simple process. Um, it's something that uh, is basically a recipe and I'm going to show you that today. Obviously, this is not the end all of your education, but hopefully the beginning of the rest of your, your successful dental career. 
So if we extract minimally traumatically or atraumatically and we learn how to graft, um, we can then successfully place an implant. Sometimes we prepare bone, uh, prepare a site with a grafting material and stage it and place an implant in the future. Um, we can objectively determine uh, radiographically when this grafted material has integrated or turned over to natural bone. But I really like to do immediate implants when I can, meaning if we can place, if we take a tooth out, uh, graft and place an implant uh, at the same time, we're able to provide an excellent service to the patient, provide them a high quality care and save them a lot of time. I'm going to say right up front, and I'll say it probably a couple more times um, during the next hour or so, is I personally am not a big immediate load person, meaning I like immediate placement of implants. I like um, a one stage uh, implant placement, meaning we, we'll put a, a healing abutment uh, into uh, an implant and allow the tissue to heal around a component that penetrates through the soft tissue, which eliminates the need for future anesthetic and uncovering of any implant. But I'm not a big, big user of actually putting teeth um, on implants that I place. Now, I know many of you have seen many, many speakers. Uh, I'm just telling you personally, um, you know, with my experience, I've, I've run into problems with that uh, patient compliance. Uh, and the rules are sometimes challenging. And at this juncture, at this stage of my career, I, I really want success. Um, I don't want there to be uh, any issues. So I'm gonna say that right up front and we can move forward uh, from that point. We do immediate load of full arch cases uh, because those are specifically placed uh, strategically in an arch form, which is a very strong architectural design. So enough words, let's get into the clinical. Um, Lauren, thank you for the beautiful introduction. Uh, actually, um, I'm very proud to say the University of Detroit Mercy is my, my dental school. Uh, I'm very proud to be associated with it. This is a view of Northern Michigan. For those of you around the country who, who've never been to Northern Michigan, it is actually a piece of heaven on earth, especially this time of year. You see a website listed there very briefly, drkosinski.com. It is an education website only, and I think it would be a, a really good reference for you if if some of the information I, I've given you today went a little bit too fast. It has most of my publications, over 240. Uh, a lot of my videos, if you go to YouTube, um, I think we have over 200 uh, um, clinical video um, descriptions um, that would be useful for you. So what do we hope to learn today in the next hour? Well, let's learn about, as I mentioned, atraumatic or minimally traumatic uh, extraction techniques that help to maintain bone. Again, second time I've said this, bone is gold to me. If we're able to maintain uh, the height and width of available bone, our final implant restoration will be that much more successful. Not only today or tomorrow or six months from now or six years from now, but 39 years from now. And so it's very important that we learn proper techniques to manage our patients successfully. Socket preservation, meaning we take a tooth out, we have all the walls intact, I'll refer to that as a four wall de de uh, defect, uh, is an excellent um, place, uh, area for placement of uh, different grafting materials to grow bone. Um, reflection, we'll talk about how I reflect. And it's kind of unique, uh, as I said, I was just in New Jersey speaking and, and we all are taught a certain way, but I'm going to kind of, kind of um, stretch your, your mental acuity, and I'm going to show you what works for me. Doctors, there's a hundred ways of doing what I'm going to show you in the next hour or so, 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to show you what works for me, my recipe to grow bone. And if you want the same results, I'm going to show you specifically two materials that I use, an allograft material and a synthetic material called an osteogen, um, all available through Golden Dent. Uh, I'm going to show you my reflection techniques, and I'm going to show you the specific membranes, resorbable membranes um, that I use and the type of sutures I use. Um, if we can leave you with that specific information, I think it will be very helpful for you to have uh, excellent prognosis, prognoses with your, your implant cases, your grafting cases, and your extraction cases. And 
we will talk specifically going with the title uh, we're going to understand the principles for successful immediate implant placement meaning taking a tooth out grafting and immediately placing an implant so it's important that we we understand situations this was just done uh today as a matter of fact uh we had a patient who came in with internal resorption we all know that we don't really understand what internal resorption is caused from it's one of the things so we're going to uh, we we anesthetize the patient and we're using something called the physics forcep i'll go into this a little bit quicker this is a quick video we did on our iphone uh, for you today and you can see I'm really not putting any pressure. So we're doing a, a traumatic or minimally traumatic. The patient has um, uh, some anesthetic and I am not putting a lot of pressure. I'm using two finger or the base of my thumb and a finger. I'm luxating the tooth up and out of the socket and I'm taking something called a tooth delivery instrument and this extraction was a matter of seconds i kind of gave you real time i'm going to show you how it's very important to number one evaluate the facial plate of bone this is the um drill that we're using now in our practice from golden dent uh it's very very economical um piece of equipment very high quality uh, i really like it a lot and kurt you may want to describe it um at the end I'm not going to talk about specifically about the type of implant or the design, but basically with any implant system, we want to idealize the placement of our implant. We start with a pilot drill, then we simply widen the osteotomy. The position of my hands is very specific. We're actually three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect. Here we're using a synthetic material called Osteogen from Golden Dent and it is calcium appetite in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. And this is my grafting procedure. I'm condensing to the crest or slightly above. Now I'm using the natural tooth as a guide for the position or size of the implant. And you can see once I've created the osteotomy, I am simply threading my implant into the socket site, into the osteotomy that I had grafted initially. That graft material is, is being pushed by the implant to the outer surfaces of the socket. And then I'm simply going to continue to torque my implant. And that implant placement ideally wants, I want it to be one millimeter subcrestal. I know I'm going fast here. We'll go into great details here. This is just a case that I that I demonstrated uh, today. I'm going to bury the implant. We put a cover screw. And again, I'm gonna take a little small piece of this uh, calcium appetite, and I'm using it to protect the coronal portion of my surgical site. If the patient's a smoker, especially, we wanna protect that implant from heat, tar, nicotine, and I'll show you the suturing techniques to maintain interceptal bone. You can see the interceptal bone maintain interdental papilla uh, when we finally restore it. In this situation, we fabricated a flipper type appliance for her um, that she can wear that is not engaging the implant whatsoever. Very, very quick description of what we are going to do uh, today. Um, here we have um, a tooth that is fractured. As I mentioned earlier, we are seeing so many broken teeth and you have to be prepared as a general dentist to understand that some teeth are just not restorable long term. Here we're taking the physics forcep again from Golden Dent. I'm placing the beak again. I'll go through this a little bit more uh, um, directly in a few moments. But I'm. It has two components. The beak is the shovel-shaped edge, shovel-shaped edge that will engage the palatal surface one to three millimeters. The bumper is placed high up the vestibule. I'm placing simple finger pressure that will luxate the tooth up and out of the socket. I'm taking what we call a tooth delivery instrument and removing this tooth in a matter of seconds as opposed to minutes, eliminating the stress, atraumatically extracting a tooth, atraumatic to the bone, atraumatic to the patient, and atraumatic to me as the dentist. I'm going to curette. I'm going to do a little purchase point. Now we would like to place the implant 
if we had field goal posts right in the center of that socket, and I'd like to place it along the central groove area. So here I am reflecting the tissue with what I like to refer to as an envelope reflection. Doctors, I am not making any vertical incisions here. All I need to do is see that facial plate. Why? Then a lot of implants, my mistakes, my issues are because I place the implant too far facial. We must maintain a millimeter or two millimeters, ideally, of facial plate for success of our implants. If I can see the facial plate, I can easily place the implant. And again, I start with a small diameter burr to a wider, making my osteotomy, determining size, shape, position, either with CBCT analysis or two-dimensionally with our digital radiographs. I'm taking this osteogen plug and simply filling the socket. Doctors, this is a matter of minutes. This material is probably $40 or $50. I'm taking my implant and simply threading it into position. Hand tightening it. I have complete control. And then I'm going to torque the implant again in an immediate extraction site. Ideally, I'd like to place that implant one millimeter subcrestal. That allows for physiologic shrinkage of the bone, which we would expect following tra uh, traumatically um, removing a tooth. Again, if a patient's a smoker, I will make a little manhole cover and I will cover the coronal portion of that extraction site, place it firmly onto the facial and suture. I will, that implant is ideally placed and it really becomes a very routine procedure. Again, I just wanted to demonstrate some of these very quickly. Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Kaczynski from Bingham Farms, Michigan. And today I wanna to demonstrate one of our atraumatic or minimally traumatic extraction techniques using the Salvin Dental Autotome. Removing a tooth such as this uh, unrestorable maxillary central incisor can be challenging in certain situations. You can see here with our period. I'm going to talk through this. So we have teeth that are very, very challenging to remove. Uh, the facial plate is very thin, sometimes fingernail thin, and it's not unusual that we fracture that, that facial plate. So doing an atraumatic extraction is very, very, very important. And here we use a different technique. Um, we're using an Essex retainer. We took his natural tooth and we did a suck down so that he would have Simply a transitional to wear. And here I'm using an auto tome to remove the tooth atraumatically. Again, we have a socket that has attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant. And we're going to make our initial osteotomy using what we refer to as a pilot burr. It's a 2.6 diameter burr that will make my initial penetration. It will allow me to angle that implant properly, mesial distally. We want to, to, to center the field goal posts of the adjacent teeth. But as importantly, we also want to determine length and mesial, uh, facial palatal uh, direction. We are never going to place an immediate implant directly into the socket site because, again, that facial plate is so thin that it is going to, could eventually cause an issue or failure. I think we've all seen the grayness in the aesthetic zone of an implant placed too far facially. So ideally, the implant needs to be placed about three millimeters palatal. I'm using the palatal uh, root surface or the socket surface as my guide. And I'm going to, to extend this initial penetration using the pilot burr about two millimeters past the apex. This gives us great initial stability and allows room for both the abutment, the custom abutment that I will fabricate, and the final, uh, final um, crown that we have to create. So positioning of this immediate implant is very important. So I will do my osteotomy first. And again, I'm looking at the dead space. I'm always thinking tooth 
first. Thinking tooth position. That's the advantage you have, uh, the general dentists out here. You really understand tooth position. And using high quality materials, high quality drills will allow you to idealize the placement of your implants to a high level. So I'm making my initial uh, uh, penetration. I'm using that, that uh, pilot bird to determine position. And then I'm simply going to widen the osteotomy with a series of osteotomy burrs. Again, with the idea that I'm going to place that implant um, about one millimeter subcrestal into the socket. You can see where my access hole will be um, with the, this position of the osteotomy burr. It should be right in the cingulum area. I did not place the implant into the socket site. Rather, I am about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent tooth using that palatal bone of the socket uh, for, for stability. But this also Palatal means the facial aspect. this also means that I have um, a defect on the facial aspect. So here again, I grafted with my osteogen calcium appetite in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix from uh, from Golden Dent, and then I'm going to simply thread that implant right into position, one millimeter subcrestal. If I'm able to achieve at least 25 newton centimeters of torque, I can place what what is referred to as a healing abutment. And a healing abutment is simply a taller screw that will penetrate through the soft tissue slightly above the crest and will allow the uh, attached gingiva to form a cuff around it. Using this, this threaded piece through the soft tissue eliminates the need for secondary uncovering and anesthesia in the future. But to use this, we must, we must um, get at least 25 newton centimeters of torque. Now the literature will say if we get 35 newton centimeters of torque, we can immediately load this tooth, meaning we could put a transitional tooth on it, uh, keep it out of occlusion. But as I mentioned before, that's something that I don't do very, um, very frequently. So I will torque that abutment and you can see my position of the implant. And if you go back to the first, uh, first CT that I showed, Remember how thin that facial plate was. It was, was a little bit thicker than a fingernail. Or the implant was actually placed palatal to that, that facial plate. We put an Essex. The patient, as an emergency, can leave with a, uh, some type of aesthetic restoration. Four months after healing, we can see the incredible tissue health of that immediately placed implant, extracted atraumatically, grafted with a synthetic material, implant placement, healing abutment, four months of, Take the, of healing. Um, the, the penguin. Um, four months of healing and uh, seating of the final crown. Multi-peg. Okay. Atraumatic extractions. Now here's another indication. Um, a patient presented, a long time patient with two root canals uh, that had fractured. Again, in the age of COVID, we are seeing a lot of damaged teeth, a lot of fractured teeth. And again, I'm going to use the physics force out. This is a series of four instruments, upper right, upper anterior, upper left, lower universal. I wouldn't practice without these instruments and something you can talk to, um, to Kurt at the end of the program. I'm sure he has some type of special. It consists of two components. The shovel shaped beak is the working end of the instrument. It will engage the root of a tooth one to three millimeters sub, sub gingival on the palatal or lingual aspect. The second component is we refer to as a bumper, and you can see there's a green sheath on it. It's a little silicone um, disposable protector. And this part will be placed as high up the vestibule or as far down the vestibule as possible. This is a very specifically designed instrument that allows us to luxate a tooth up and out of the socket by creating tension on the palatal or lingual aspect of the tooth. By creating tension, we are going to get a physiologic 
reaction of the body releasing an enzyme that is going to break down the periodontal ligament. Now, doctors, what's holding that tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. If the periodontal ligament is melted away, the tooth, the tooth root, will luxate up and out of the socket following that arc of rotation of this instrument. I don't need to luxate it. I don't need to put uh, a conventional forcep using our tremendous force squeezing, figure eights, mesial distal buccal lingual, because you know what happens in, in some, some situations, we break bone, we break the facial plate, or worse, we fracture roots. When we fracture a root, we take a lot of time, doctors, in trying to, to remove that root. We get frustrated. We get frustrated and oftentimes we leave root tips in the body. I see it all the time in my practice and it's very frustrating for me to go back and place an implant because I have to physically get those little root tips out. So it's an instrument that I think is very valuable. Uh, time is of the essence and giving the patient as positive an experience as possible, as atraumatic an experience as possible. That first case that I showed you that I just did on my iPhone uh, today for you, um, she looked at me and she said, you're kidding, you're, you're done. People are very apprehensive about the injection, but more, more apprehensive about the extraction. And if you can give them a relatively positive experience, that's the best marketing you can have in your practice. That's something that, that you will be respected and known for your clinical techniques. So as I said, two components, this um, shovel-shaped edge, uh, which will in, uh, engage the palatal lingual aspect of the tooth, one to three millimeters uh, subgingival, the bumper is placed as high up or down below the vestibule as possible. It is not the working end of the instrument. It is not holding the facial plate. It is not doing anything but being a fulcrum point or a center of rotation for this uniquely designed instrument. You never squeeze this instrument. Now, um, Kurt um, has programs, uh, teaching programs uh, where you can come in to Detroit uh, very high quality, beautiful hotels, shuttling, and you can spend a day uh, with Dr. Nazarian, and he will uh, teach you how to use this instrument correctly. Our muscle memory is going to want us to, to, to squeeze the instrument, and you don't want to. All we need to do is create tension on the lingual or palatal aspect of the tooth, and within a minute, these teeth will pop up and out of the socket and it can be an amazing experience for you and your patients. So here we're placing the beak on the palatal aspect, the bumper is high up the vestibule, and again, we're creating tension on that palatal surface, and the tooth will luxate up and out of the socket following that very specific arc of rotation of the instrument. It is absolutely brilliant, and I'll say it again, I would not physically practice without this instrument uh, in the office. So the tooth is luxated, it is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, I will take something called a tooth delivery instrument, a bird beak forcep, and I will remove these teeth atraumatically. Now, whenever I remove a tooth, I always, always, always take a radiograph. I wanna make sure that um, all the root structure has been uh, eliminated. But now we have to evaluate the site. We're looking at the socket site, so I want you to take your curette and I want you to evaluate all the walls of the socket, mesial, distal, palatal, facial. What happens if we don't have a facial plate? We are going to make what I refer to as a, an envelope reflection, meaning I am not making vertical incisions, rather I'm going halfway around the adjacent teeth and I'm taking my periosteal elevator and peeling this this attached gingiva, almost like an orange away from the site so that I can physically see the defect. Doctors, this is really important. I wanna physically see the defect. So you have to feel comfortable incising and reflecting tissue. The reason why I do not make vertical incisions as most of us were trained to do, if you incise into mucosa, your patients will have postoperative discomfort because prostaglandin and histamine will be released 
the patients will sell, will swell and will be uncomfortable. If you do not incise into mucosal tissue, we do not get that extensive release of histamine and prostaglandin, and our patients have a positive experience where um, 600 milligrams of ibuprofen is more than adequate for any um, discomfort that they may have. And remember that uh, 800 milligrams is no more efficacious than 600, so there's no reason to over-medicate um, these patients. So I'm reflecting the tissue, both facially and palatally. Doctors, you have to feel comfortable doing this. I went through the process of placing the implants, not in the socket site, but rather in the central groove area, thinking tooth first, thinking emergence of the tooth, emergence profile, smile design. The implants have to be a minimum of at least three millimeters apart because there's no blood supply between them. And the teeth should be no closer than two millimeters from the adjacent PDL. These are just simple rules that we discuss in our courses uh, where we have a little bit more time. I just wanna introduce you to things that we're able to do. But here you can clearly see there is no facial plate of bone. There is no facial plate of bone here. So we are going to graft it. I mentioned to you in the very beginning that I would, I promised you that I would teach you how to bo grow bone 100% of the time. And we can grow bone in a socket and we can grow bone to a facial plate physiologically without a problem. But how do we do that? Now, I showed you several cases where I use the synthetic calcium appetite in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. We call it osteogen from Golden Dent. Uh, it is a very, very high quality material. You do not need a membrane with it. But when I have a facial defect greater than five millimeters, I wouldn't use that product uh, primarily. Rather, I will use an allograft material, which is um, demineralized cortical cancellous blend, human bone that's been uh, properly cleaned. Whenever we use an allograft material, we must, we must protect it from invagination of epithelium. Epithelium grows 10 times faster than bone. And if you do not protect it from invagination of epithelium, the case may become unpredictable. Now to do that, we will use a membrane. And I mentioned to you that I, I, I use a resorbable membrane. I don't even use a non-resorbable membrane in my practice anymore. And the important part of a membrane to protect the allograft is that you extend it at least two millimeters beyond the defect. Now, doctors, many of us know this. We know we do extractions. We know we do implant preparations. We know we do um, grafting, and we know we place a membrane. But that position of the membrane is so critical. We have a tendency as general dentists, as I did, is to tuck. We try to force the membrane into position. We tuck and we take a lot of time. We usually give up and we suture over the top of it. Number two, very important part of a membrane is that membrane must remain passively in position for at least six weeks. If the membrane comes out before six weeks, the case becomes unpredictable. And I can't tell you that you're gonna grow bone predictably. So learn how to reflect tissue. Learn how to visualize your extraction site. Learn how to properly place our implants. Use a proper graft material. And if we're using allograft, protect that, that graft from invagination of epithelium by placing a membrane passively at least two millimeters beyond the defect and passively onto the palatal. I like to use the gold ass uh, 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 particulate allograft material, high quality. And what I really like um, about what, what Kurt and Golden Dent has done is they are making materials affordable to us as general dentists. Um, grafting uh, can be a relatively expensive um, uh, procedure for our patients. And so being able to provide this service to your patients is very, very valuable and important. Now we will take this material and I will wet it 
in uh, sterile water or sterile saline. Doctors never use an anesthetic to wet your allograft material. When you wet it, it becomes a gel. It makes it very easy to handle, but do not use anesthetic. Anesthetic has a pH of two, and that may inhibit uh, bone growth. It may be inhibit or slow down osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. I use two different membranes um, in the practice. EpiGuide is a synthetic material. It's bioresorbable. It has three layers, um, and, it, and it maintains for up to 20 weeks. I mentioned that I need my membrane to last a minimum of six weeks passively. And you do not need primary closure to protect the allograft from invagination of epithelium. So here I'm taking my uh, gold, gold os allograft material, cortical cancellus, 250 to 1,000 microns, and I'm wetting it with sterile water, sterile saline, blood, um, PRF, PRP. But let's not get into too, uh, let's not get into the weeds too much. Let's just wet it. We will take our membrane and and correctly uh, contour it. We don't want sharp angles, and you can see because I could see exactly where that defect ended, I was able to passively place that membrane at least two millimeters beyond the defect. No hands. I'm not tucking, forcing anything. This becomes my new wall. I'm then taking my wetted gold os material and I'm packing the facial aspect of the defect completely. And then I'm passively um, moving that membrane onto the palatal aspect. Again, it is passively placed, doctors. I'm not forcing it, I'm not tugging it. Now, suturing is very important. In dentistry, we use reverse cutting needles. We are using reverse cutting needles uh, of different diameters, three quarters, one half diameter. These are our. Um, um, reverse cutting needles uh, so they will not tear the tissue. I like to use PGA or polyglycolic acid synthetic material, Vicro. Uh, you, can, you can purchase this from, from Golden Dent. It's absorbable, braided, and it lasts for about 28 days and it resorbs to water. I like this material. Number one, we all get used to certain products because it handles very well. It handles like silk, resorbs to water. We don't get a lot of, of plaque accumulation on it. So that is my go-to suture personally. I don't use silk very often, uh, if ever. Plain gut, chromic gut, I know a lot of us use that material. I just have, it, I find it challenging to, to, to manage. Um, the thread sizes with our dental sutures are 3.0 to 6.0. I think you should purchase from, from Kurt. 3-0 and 4-0, that's what I use. And I would have 3 8 circle and 1 half circle. Those are the products I have. Osteogen from Golden Dent, Allograph, Demineralized Cortical Cancellous Particulate, 250 to 1,000 microns. EpiGuide is a synthetic membrane, a collagen membrane, a resorbable membrane, and two types of sutures and two types of needles. That's all I have in my office. That gives us tremendous success. So the sutures, uh, again, I'm sure they will have sp uh, specials or how they're packaged. This is a really great book and I, I do promote it a lot. I bought it a long time ago. You may wanna take a photo of it. Um, and if you can uh, find it and purchase it, um, it is a schematic of all the different types of suturing uh, techniques that I use in my practice. We don't have time to do that. Although Lauren, I you know we we've done many um, suturing webinars that are pretty popular. So um, it's, it's a great book. You can practice on an orange or, or a lemon or a grapefruit and get really proficient at your suturing techniques. Now, let me slow down a little bit because this is um, important techniques. Most of us were trained to suture from facial to palatal. I hope most of you are, are nodding right now. And the problem with going facial to palatal with a reverse cutting needle is there's a tendency to grab onto your membrane because you can't see it. 
And if you grab onto your membrane and you do bring the patient back for suture removal, your staff will remove the sutures. Oftentimes they will remove that membrane and not tell you. They may not even be aware of it. If that membrane is not maintained intact for at least six weeks, then the case becomes unpredictable. And many of you may have done this, may have done extractions and grafting and gone back and found that it did, wasn't bone, it was just mush. So the technique that I teach is rather than going from facial to palatal, I'd like you to take your reverse cutting needle and go from the crestal aspect onto the facial. So I'm sliding that reverse cutting needle on top of the membrane and I can see it slide on top of the membrane. It's not possible for me to grab onto it. I will then reverse the needle and go from crestal to palatal. Again, sliding over that membrane. You can do interrupted sutures, you can do mattress sutures. You can see that I did not get primary closure. I'm respecting a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I don't want primary closure in these situations. To get primary closures, I would have to stretch the tissue from facial to the palatal aspect, meaning I would be pulling the mucosal tissue onto the facial aspect of our implant. Doctors, again, many of you see this, whether you've done it or not, our patients are uncomfortable. We have periodontal issues because we do not have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of your implants. You must, at least two millimeters. So I don't have primary closure here. I will see this patient in one week to remove the sutures. And I don't expect complete closure. Epithelium physiologically is going to grow anywhere from a half to a millimeter a day. So it may take two weeks for this epithelium to grow over the top of the membrane, but I don't need primary closure to achieve that. So maintain that membrane, use either an allograft material or an alloplastic material, respect the band of attached gingiva, understand the importance of a um, envelope reflection where I'm not making vertical incisions into mucosa, eliminating prostaglandin and histamine release. Our patients do not experience discomfort. They will take 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. Hopefully this will change the way you think and practice. The implants heal. Here we fabricated custom abutments with margins at or slightly subgingival. We clearly have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of our implant, and we did simply did two zirconia bruxer crowns. We know if we remove teeth, bone is going to shrink down and in indenture patients. We can get um, uh, paresthesia, uh, mental foramen dehiscence, the face collapses. So grafting is so important. Grafting at the time of extraction will help minimize bone loss, will help support soft tissue architecture, helps maintain the periodontal health, and ideally will provide adequate site for implants in three to four months routinely. And we can objectively see the changeover of our graft. Any graft material is physiologically is going to heal from the apex towards the crest. So I expect in three to four months, more bone maturity at the apical portion than towards the crustal portion. That's fine because with all our dental implants today, our initial stability occurs from the apical two millimeters. If you don't graft, soft tissue will invaginate the, um, the part particulate. Uh, we will lose height and width of ridge. And the literature says that we will get 30 to 60% bone loss in a three year period, which means that the patient may require more invasive surgical procedures, much more expensive surgical procedures. Doctors, this is an important slide for you to understand in educating and instructing your patients on why it's important that we, we graft socket sites. It's an added expense to your patients and oftentimes our Dell insurance doesn't cover it. 
So you have to feel comfortable doing the procedure, preparing the site for a future implant, which is your bread and butter. Your implant abutment and crown is the most profitable thing uh, treatment that you will you will do in your practice. So be aware of the importance. Um, socket grafting failures, as I mentioned, occur where we lose the membrane, um, the uh, wound opens, the or we develop an infection because we did not curette properly. Uh, we must remove all granulation tissue from the socket site. Um, if there is an active infection, I normally would not immediately place an implant, but if there was an active infection, I would curette and I have no problem grafting that. Similar to uh, if you have a hangnail, it's miserable, you can't walk, it hurts, you soak your foot, you clip the hangnail, Within five minutes, you forgot that you even had a problem. Once you eliminate the source of the infection, the body will heal very, very well. Let's do one more uh, case here, uh, Lauren, and then we'll we'll finish up for questions. Uh, an anterior case, um, a very nice person, very, very uh, apprehensive, very self-conscious, had trauma early on, was was very careful with these teeth. Um, they were were a little bit mobile. Uh, a lot of damage to the teeth. Patient would not, uh, really her quality of life was really diminished. Um, she was not going to, um, to bite into an apple or a bagel, would cut her sandwiches in place. So our CBCT analysis is very important. We use the Vatex CBCT, which allows me to do a lot of uh, virtual design, a lot of education for my patients. Again, I want you to see where the tooth position is here and the thinness of the facial plate and the architectural design in the sagittal view, the cross-sectional view. The facial plate is very thin and there is a, a palatal angulation in the aesthetic zone. So doctors, you would never, never place an implant directly into this socket site because you will end up with problems that you've seen where you get failure or exposure of threads or the gray part. So we remove this tooth and we are going to virtually place our implant three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of our adjacent tooth, not into the socket site. And again, the other central incisor removing and virtually designing our implant position using the apices and extending our implants two millimeters at least beyond the socket site where our initial stability occurs. We can educate our patients and, and explain to them, we remove their teeth, we will curette, graft, we can virtually place our implants ideally before we ever touch our patient. We can design the final prostheses we can explain any disharmony that may occur, uh, whether the crown and roots will be longer in the tissue or not. This can all be determined prior to any surgical intervention. So here's our patient with mobile teeth. We are going to atraumatically remove them. This is a great, great, inexpensive grafting kit from Golden Dent. I strongly recommend, and Kurt, hopefully you can give them a special on this. Uh, it has everything that I would need to use to remove a tooth and include in that the physics forceps, uh, the gold golden uh, uh, gold os bone grafting material, the, uh, the osteogen, calcium appetite material, the epiguide and a collagen um, resorbable membrane, and you are set to go. Um, Kurt will probably describe these instruments a little bit future, but it's just wonderful set of high quality instruments. So here I'm taking simply taking a periotome to evaluate anesthesia. I'm taking my physics forcep, engaging the, the shovel-shaped um, beak onto the palatal surface, placing the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, not squeezing the instrument, simply with two fingers rotating my wrist towards the nose. Again, that bumper is not maintaining the facial plate, rather it is simply a fulcrum point my hand position, and within a matter of seconds, that tooth will disengage. I will then take my tooth delivery instrument and remove what's left of the tooth. 
teeth. We're evaluating the socket, doctors. We're going to curette, 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 curette. Now, you can see interceptal bone there. Um, there is some damage, but maintaining that interceptal bone is critical to the final uh, aesthetics in the aesthetic zone. Without interdental papilla, without interceptal bone, you will never get interdental papilla. And then we have to compensate with our um, a restorative crowns. We have to make everything wider. We've all seen that. So maintaining an interceptal bone using the physics forcep is important. I'm going to make my envelope reflection to visualize the facial defect. And you can see on the number nine area, there's a significant facial defect. Number eight, I have a facial plate that is fingernail thin, but we did not damage it using our physics forcep. We're going to curette, 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 eliminate the granulation tissue, eliminate purple blood, taking my gold os, cortical cancellous mixture, wetting it with sterile water, sterile saline, making a putty, and taking my membrane, here is a collagen membrane, uh, shaping it to the defect area, rounding the corners so that I can passively place it at least two millimeters beyond the defect and onto the palatal surface. Again, without getting into a lot of details with the surgical technique, we're starting with a pilot burr. We are not engaging the socket, rather we're three millimeters palatal using the palatal uh, bone of the socket and we're going to engage it two millimeters beyond the de defect to create our initial stability, again, using the, um, the uh, motor from Goldoss and Kurt, I'm sure you're, you have a great special on this. It's a very, very economical, high quality. I, I just love it to death. We're going to widen the osteotomy. I'm checking my position. Remember, I want the implant to be placed one millimeter subcrestal in an immediate extraction site. Widening the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy, placing my implant, torquing into position. I place both implants, but you can see again on the maxillary left um, central incisor, I have quite a defect there. So I'm going to put cover screws and I'm going to repair the defect by first placing my membrane passively beyond the defect. And I'm grafting with my a gold os cortical cancellus filling the void, passively placing that membrane onto the palatal, and simply suturing all of the technique that I demonstrated earlier, crest to facial, crest to palatal, making sure I'm sliding over the top of the membrane, getting immediate closure. Patient has a flipper type appliance to wear. After healing, we place healing abutments and you can see the incredible health of the, the tissue the tissue cup that's created. And we were able to finalize the final aesthetics and improve the quality of life of our patient dramatically. So our transition from design to extraction to implant placement and grafting virtual design, so I know exactly what my results are going to occur before I ever start. This is artificial intelligence to a high degree. It allows us to maximize our results, increase your prognosis, increase your efficiency and your proficiency. Doctors, this is it within your wheelhouse. Doctors, you need to, to understand the importance of implant dentistry. I started in 1985 been doing this a long time. I'm here to help you. And Lauren, it is almost nine o'clock and um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have. And I'm sure Kurt um, has some specials. I hope he does um, for our, uh, it's a big group today. Thank you. Thank you everybody for staying the whole time. I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you. And we will get to the questions, but as you mentioned, typically uh, Kurt will have a, a special. So uh, Kurt, if you're on, I'm going to put the screen over to you and you can uh, 
go over that information before we do the Q&A session. All right, Lauren, thank you. I appreciate it. My name is Kurt Lawler. I am with Golden Dent, uh, also based uh, here in Detroit, like Dr. Uh, Kaczynski. Um, we're a third generational dental family. Uh, we uh, started with the physics forceps and we focus on providing simple, predictable, and unconventional type dental products for dentists. And then we also have some education, which I'll speak about here in a moment. So uh, as mentioned, uh, on each webinar, we normally do give different uh, promotional type codes. So uh, without further ado, tonight's code is uh, now 13. So it's just NOW13, which will give you a 13% discount on uh, any of the products that are shown on our website or that were displayed this evening. Uh, Golden-dent.com is our website. Um, obviously, or else you can give us a call in, in the office tomorrow, and we're, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, we do these for 24 hours, so that'll be good through uh, tomorrow evening, uh, September 20th. I'm going to speak quickly uh, so we have time for the questions. I'm just going to go over uh, a couple of things that we do here at Golden Den if you're not familiar with our business, or maybe um, it's been a little time since you've joined a webinar, and I just wanted to mention some of the new products that we have uh, available. So extractions and grafting, that's what we started with. So obviously the physics forceps, we have our uh, gold os allograft, which was mentioned, and uh, our grafting set and the suturing, everything that goes with extractions and grafting, we have those available here at Golden Dent. So physics forceps, this is the standard series set. This is what we always recommend starting with. There's always a trial period on the products you've uh, heard of the physics forceps or maybe have never heard of them or they piqued your interest, uh, this is the set I would recommend. Uh, we do have a different set of instruments that's more designed for uh, erupted third molars or po posterior teeth. Um, but this set here will uh, get most te teeth in the mouth and is our most popular set uh, to start out with. So I would look at these if you um, have any interest in the physics forceps. It's called the standard series. Uh, GMX 100 200 series. We also have conventional forceps. Uh, we were asked to make these, so we did make your conventional 150, 151. If you're looking for uh, one of these types of instruments, um, obviously you can use the code and, and save on these also. Uh, these are uh, relatively inexpensive uh, uh, conventional type forceps. So prior to using the physics forceps, we often get asked, you know, should I use a luxator, an elevator, or this instrument at the top that we have called the wedge? Um, you know, it can't hurt. Um, the physics forceps is really a lingual elevator, if you think about the way uh, and how it works. So it's not always something that's necessary, um, but obviously this will um, make the procedure even easier, prevent any um, tearing or damage to the tissue. It's something we would definitely recommend and we have these available to, to uh, start to separate the PDL prior to the physics forceps or any conventional type instrument that you may use. Uh, we didn't really talk about this one too much, but I just wanted to mention it. This is a nice kit that we put together for anybody that is doing extractions, grafting and, and implants. Uh, if you can't manually cure at uh, the socket site, these are really nice tissue and degranulation burrs that we have that are shown there at the top. And then oftentimes following the extraction, uh, if you have any um, bony spicules or have to level the bone or shape the bone, uh, this is the uh, two burrs that we like, those bone shaping burrs. We have the round and then the uh, uh, oval or football shape type burrs. And then a nice sectioning burr and then just a shaping burr. So this is a nice kit we put together. It's nice to keep with your grafting uh, instruments. They're, they're obviously not uh, one-time type use burrs. It's something that you would keep around for a while. This is a curette. Uh, this is a good one to use prior to using the osteogen plug or any grafting procedure. It's a, a serrated curette, so it's going to clean the uh, socket site out well uh, prior to placing your graft material. This is the kit. So uh, if anybody does call and wants to, uh, this kit does have the uh, normal curette in there without the serrations. Um, if you do call, um, and you're interested in the serrated curette prior, uh, in, in addition to, to this one or in replace of this one, just mention that and 
and we'll be able to help you swap that one out of the kit here. So the plugs, uh, the large is the most popular, the 20 by 10 size. They do have a slim and an extra large. Uh, we find those, those aren't as popular. The large shape is definitely uh, the most popular size plug if you've never used these. They come in a, a five or a 10 pack. And uh, as mentioned on the webinar, they're around $50 per plug. With the discount, I guess they're a little bit cheaper. So in the 40, 40 some dollar range per, per plug. So it's $279 for a box of five or $499 for a box of uh, 10 prior to the discount code. There's these other two um, flat type shaped uh, osteogen bone graft materials also. Those are not membranes. If you have any questions about those, because I don't really have uh, time to to mention those or speak to in detail on those, just, just give us a call in the office so we can explain what those are. This is our, our particulate. If there's obviously a lot of bone graft on the market. This is the one that um, Dr. Krasinski likes. We, we made this um, quite a while ago or, or sourced it quite a while ago based on the needs of our class instructors uh, that prefer the mineralized cortical cancellus at the 250 to 1000 microns. Uh, this is a, an, an allograph that we have that we always have great deals on and we do the five plus ones and then we have the, the code this evening and then we also have it in the putty form uh, for, for those types of cases if you prefer a putty, otherwise we have it in the particulate um, type of glass dish. So the EpiGuide was mentioned quite a bit this evening. It's a great mem membrane. The only problem with the EpiGuide, it's been on uh, back order for quite some time, unfortunately. So we, uh, we've been using the Cytoflex Resorb PLA PGA membrane for quite some time now. And it's actually a really good membrane. It's also a long lasting membrane that we find handles uh, very similar to the EpiGuide, uh, which is what a lot of people liked. It also comes in a couple different sizes and it has a better price point actually than, than the EpiGuide. Uh, we're hoping to have the EpiGuides again here, um, actually this towards the end of this month. Uh, but we've heard that before and it's uh, there's been a long delay. So I would look at maybe the Cytoflex if you're looking to get started uh, with trying our membranes on a, on a more sooner basis. And then hopefully we have the Epi guides again soon. The PGA sutures, we talked about those. Uh, this is our polygalactic uh, acid PGA suture. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, the 3 and 4 If you're using another brand, take a look at your price to compare them to these. Uh, it's a good suture and it's priced, priced very affordable. Uh, I don't think we mentioned this. This is a good hemostatic uh, bleeding uh, control uh, product. You basically just place it onto the socket site or where you have the bleeding, and it helps uh, control the bleeding quite rapidly. It turns into a gel. So it's a good alternative to like a gel foam type product. Uh, you can read more about that on our website. So beyond extractions and grafting, I'm going to fly through this really quick. Uh, we have a couple other different categories. So this is, we have the Woodpecker brand. So the Woodpecker surgical motor is what's shown there in the middle. Um, I think it's around, I think it's around, uh, gosh, hopefully I don't misquote, but I think it's like 2000-ish range. And that actually comes with the 20 to one handpiece, which is an LED uh, lit handpiece. So a very affordable motor. We've been very happy with it. We've been using it in our courses and programs for quite some time now. Uh, we also have the Penguin, which is a great uh, product uh, to determine the implant stability. And then we have the spotter device, which is shown on the left there, which is for uh, helping locate a submerged implant under the tissue, uh, and then allows you to use a tissue punch. So it's kind of like a metal detector for, for dental implants. This is off subjects, but I'm just going to mention it if you haven't uh, checked out our website recently or, or been to, uh, Looked at our catalog recently. We do have a, a large endo line. So we do have all the woodpecker endo motors, obturation systems, apex locators, all the files and everything that goes with it. Um, take a look at that or if you have any questions, give us a call. Restorative, it's a great curing light, about less than $500. We've been very, very happy with the OSTAR curing light and our restorative materials, such as our sectional matrix system. For, for any hygienist, uh, we Recently added uh, air polishers. Uh, we have several affordable air polishers that are uh, handheld type polishers. This is our more expensive PTP model from Woodpecker. That's an air polisher and an ultrasonic scalar combo. This would be something like equivalent to the uh, air EMS airflow type system, uh, but for a fraction of the price. 
And so we do also have all of the ultrasonic tips. Uh, and if you go to our website, it's pretty nice. You can sort uh, which brand you're using now and which one's compatible with your brand. And it'll show you the tips that we have from Woodpecker that will work with your branded um, instrument if you're not using the Woodpecker devices. So this is something that's a little new. I wanted to mention it. We have all kinds of scalers and air polishers, which we've had really good feedback on. So lastly, our education. Uh, amplified dental training is what we call our education. Here's uh, some of the upcoming dates. We have one, um, actually, I guess this weekend, we have our extraction uh, live patient course. You do all the surgeries at this course. So we have, um, we work at a teaching facility. Uh, as long as you're licensed in the US or in Canada, you can come to our facility. We do a, a one day lecture do a lot of model work. And then day two, we see patients all day. So we'll see, depending on the number of doctors and how quickly everybody's working through the program, we'll see anywhere from 65 to, you know, potentially a hundred patients, just depending on uh, how quickly we move throughout the day. So our live patient uh, AMP1 and AMP2 classes are our extractions and grafting programs. And then we also have some uh, implant and endo programs, which are mentioned there coming up. Uh, we have quite a few programs uh, coming up here, September, October, and then November. So Amplified Dental has all the information on those. Uh, take a look or give us a call if you have any questions. I'll put this code back up and turn it back to Lauren for the questions that were submitted. And I appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tim, you ready to do some Q&A? You know, Lauren, I'm always ready for you. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts about putting an immediate implant in, into an area where there's been a recently, like a, a failing endodontic treated tooth? If there's like an abscess or something like that, are you gonna wait and debride it and wait for it to heal or will you put it right in? So, you know, as I, as I mentioned briefly, and I know I speak rather quickly, but um, if there's an active infection, if there's an active infection in a site, I have no problem removing the, the tooth, curetting extensively. You need sharp instruments to do that. You need a grafting kit. Uh, curette, curette, eliminate, eliminate the granulation tissue. Purple blood is bad, red blood is good. If there's active infection, I, I don't have a problem grafting, as I mentioned, um, be, and letting the site heal before I place an implant. Rarely will I put an implant in an active infected site. However, if we have a um, endodontic, you know, um, you know, an abscess on a, on a tooth that, that is fractured and you're going to obliterate, obliterate that defect and you can get initial stability in the apical two millimeters of your implant, I would graft and, and, and place an immediate implant. But I'll be honest with you, you know, I mean, uh, depending on your experience level, um, you, you run the risk if you take a tooth, an endodontically uh, failing te tooth uh, with an active infection, you put an implant in there, there's, there's a possibility that the implant won't integrate correctly. Okay. Um, this one, I think is more for Kurt. Uh, there was a Canadian customer who would want to get the status of an order number. Um, I'll forward their information along to you, Kurt, and, and you can get back with them uh, directly. Um, what about if you're constantly uh, finding that you're fracturing the buccal plate, say on, on elderly patients or you know endo treated teeth? What what typically would the the operator be doing wrong? They were just seeing a lot of buccal plate fractures. You know, muscle memory, the way we, we learn how to do extractions, most of us, right, we would take some type of periotome and go around the tooth. We would take, we used to call them elevators, now they're luxators, a little bit, you know, and we would go interproximal and we would rotate. Um, we, we're always told to rotate towards the tooth, but many of us rotate away from the tooth to try to get the tooth to move a little bit. And then we would take a forcep and squeeze it and depending on how we were trained figure eight mesial distal buccal lingual uh circular motion and you're putting tremendous force on that available bone and what i wanted to demonstrate in those anterior cases is how thin that facial plate could be so you know fracturing is is not an uncommon thing the key with the physics forcep is you are not squeezing the instrument i'm basically using one finger and allowing tension on the palatolingual aspect of the tooth, 
and letting the the energy build up so that we get that physiologic release of, of enzyme to break down the periodontal ligament. If there's no periodontal ligament, that tooth is going to come up and out of the socket. And it happens within 30 seconds to a minute. So um, it's technique, Lauren. Uh, and I think that's where what Kurt was mentioning, the, the courses in Detroit are just phenomenal, where you, you're going to take out 20, 20 teeth, challenging teeth, um, and you will get pretty proficient at it. Okay. A uh, couple questions here for me. Yes, the webinar was recorded. Uh, the, the link for that should go out sometime in the next few days. Uh, as a reminder, I know some of you may have logged in a little bit late. The way that continuing education credit is handled is I send the list over to Golden Dent. They go through it. They see when you logged on, when you logged off. As long as you're here for the bulk of the webinar, I think it means at least 40 to 45 minutes. They don't count the Q&A session. It's just uh, that first hour of content. Um, but if you were here for most of that, you'll be sent a CE certificate. That usually takes about a week or so. And um, there's nothing you need to do on your end. There's no quiz, no registration. You know, like I said, they go through the list. And as long as you were here for the bulk of it, you'll have that sent. Keep an eye on your junk email folders because for some reason those emails tend to end up there. If you don't have something, say, by you know, a week from tomorrow, by all means, reach out to me and I'll follow up with them. Okay, uh, do you also recommend for aesthetic sites early implant placement with contour augmentation as the treatment of choice versus immediate implant or late placement following ridge preservation? Uh, yeah, well, that was a very good question. Um, you know, yeah. the the aesthetic zone is is very very challenging and takes a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of planning, and that's where where our our virtual design comes into play. Um, understanding anatomy and and the point I wanted to make in the lecture was maintaining interseptal bone will help maintain interdental papilla. An interdental papilla is very, very important in the aesthetic area. Um, we have a tendency to, to traumatically damage or remove interceptal bone without respecting, without respecting it. Um, we have a broken tooth, and what do we do? We take a 557 surgical and we, we trough around the tooth. Again, that, that bone is gold, and anytime, any, any way you can maintain interceptal bone will get interdental papilla. Now, whether or not you you do it in stages, it all depends on the torque that we're able to achieve, and and the patient's uh, maintenance in, in the area. Whether or not we can contour the soft tissue, if we want to later on do do um, a transitional abutments to to train the the tissue even more, we can do that. It it all depends on how far you want to go with your your final aesthetics. Um, torque is important. Position of the implant is important. Uh, understanding vital anatomy, understanding uh, proper positioning of that implant, uh, not in the socket site, will help maximize the final aesthetic result. Okay. Um, generally speaking, which cases will you typically do freehand versus using a surgical guide? <laughs> Great question. I, I love that question. Um, you know, I've been doing it a long time, Lauren. So, so freehand. You know, once you get to the point of understanding tooth position, um, forget about putting an implant. Put forget about putting a spark plug in the bone. That, that's not hard to drill a hole in bone. But understanding the design of the final prosthesis will dictate the position of the implant. Um, so, so freehand is fine. Guide is fine. But I think it's 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 very very important that you realize that a surgical guide is only as good as the the person that made it, and any discrepancy any discrepancy minor discrepancy in the posterior area of a guide could could create a significant um, irregularity in the anterior region. Um, I, I've done a lot of guides. I've made mistakes with guides. So I, what I was trying to demonstrate today, Lauren, was. <clears throat> If you if you are able to to make a um, non-invasive reflection, an envelope reflection, and see what you have to work with, um, you know in today's in today's society we want to do everything fast, and fast isn't necessarily better. So understand the limit your limitations. Under, use the tools that are available to you, 
but I think I think you need to t train yourself to be able to do this two dimensionally as well as as guided. Okay. Um, would you ever use PRFs instead of collagen and membranes? Absolutely. You know, you know, drawing blood and spinning it. Um, I, I, I use a lot of PRF, sticky bone, PRP. Um, that is going to to result in in a little bit faster healing, not necessarily better healing, but faster healing. Um, cer certainly, if you have the wherewithal and the time uh, to do that, that is an excellent, excellent um, um, way of, of handling the situation. Absolutely. Okay. The um, the Vatec that you use, do you know what model you're using? Um, I use the green CT, um, and as a matter of fact, we're purchasing, we're upgrading uh, to the next generation uh, of Vatec. Um, the, the reason I like that, and I, I get nothing from them, is um, they make all their own components. They actually make components for a lot of the other uh, companies, um, Lauren. And yeah. uh, I bought my machine um, nine years ago, and they're buying it back to upgrade me. So wow. there are not very many companies that will do that. Um, uh, that's significant. That's, that's, it's, that's a big savings. So I, I tell everybody in my courses, when you're ready for CBCT, at least give them the opportunity to discuss it with you. You're going to make the decision that's right for you and your your area and your budget. But um, I, I think I, I think it's just fantastic. The support is just amazing. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on PFTE sutures? Um, you know, I, I, I only use resorbable sutures, um, and I, I like the PGA because it lasts 28 days. Um, I, I, I hear that all the time. I, I just, it, it's fine there if that's what you feel comfortable with. Um, they do have to be removed. I don't think they're any better or worse. Uh, it's what you feel comfortable with. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what if you, if, you know, you have to probably go back to 18,000 implants, but you know, what's your your default? Are you typically doing an immediate implant placement technique uh, for people who want implant supported crown restorations, or or are you going the more traditional route? Or no, does it depend I, on the case. I, I, it, well, it depends on the case. Um, obviously, uh, immediate implant placement saves a lot of time um, versus um, you know healing time. If if you if you extract and graft, we're waiting three to four months, depending on the health and the, and the size of the defect. And then we're waiting another three or four months for the implant to integrate. So we're talking almost a year before we're restoring. Um, if if I'm able to remove a tooth, graft, and place an implant, that would be my 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 first goal. And I tell the patients that is our our objective. But if there's anything unusual there that does not allow me to do it, I'm always going to fall back on on a more conservative approach. Okay. Um, for four wall defects, are, are you typically placing cortical or cancellous bone graft below the osteogen in those defects? No, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't necessarily mix it. If, if you have a socket, my go-to would be the osteogen because it's, like, as Kurt said, it's forty dollars. You're just placing it in, and you can thread the implant directly into it, or or let the let it heal, and you don't need a membrane with it. The bovine Achilles tendon tendon material is such that epithelium has two choices. It could either try to grow into it as it would with allograft because it's particulate of different sizes or follow the path of least resistance. And because it's bound so tight, the epithelium is always gonna follow the path of least resistance. So the advantage of the osteogen is it's a great graft material. It forms bone in three to four months and I don't need a membrane with it. Okay. Uh... So I'm just trying to read these questions as they come in. So why are you placing the bone graft on the socket and creating another osteotomy instead of going apically past the socket for primary stabilization? Say that, say that one more time, please. Yeah, I'm just reading it. So why are you placing the bone graft on the, in the socket and creating another osteotomy instead of going apically past the socket for primary stabilization. I don't know if that was a, a case that you were showing. Yeah, well, no, I, I always do my osteotomy first. Then, then I can either place the implant and then correct the defect as I did in that where we had no facial plate, 
or I will place my graft material and thread the implant directly into the socket. My initial stability is in the apical two millimeters. I, I don't know if I answered the question, but um, okay. yeah. Well, they, they can follow up if, they, if we have time. Um, do you pack the osteogen into the osteotomy site and extraction socket in one shot indiscriminately? Yes. Now, now you know what? That's a great question because you know I know, I'll get questions, Lauren. Um, you know, sometimes they'll say, people will say, well, you know, I did the osteogen and it, it's kind of spongy, and you, you need to use enough material. And I know we're frugal as general <laughs> dentists, but if the hole is big, you can't put a little plug in there. Sometimes I use two plugs, and it is what it is. It needs to be placed firmly to the crest or slightly above the crest, as much material as you need. Okay. Um, I think that maybe this was in relation to one of the cases you were showing or a question that you answered. What do you mean by placing the implant three millimeters palatally? So, so what I was trying to demonstrate is when we have a socket, the the tooth position, the facial plate is very very thin. I'm I'm actually making my osteotomy three millim in the anterior zone. I'm placing the implant three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth. So if I take a perio probe and hold it uh, on, on on either side of a socket, I'm going to make my initial penetration three millimeters palatal to that, engaging the palatal wall and then beyond the apices. The reason we need that is because we're creating, we're gonna fabricate an abutment and the crown. So I need room for all of that to create emergence profile. Okay. Is there like a, like a super thin diamond bird that you use to do the troughing? Uh, no, the, you know, there's a 1.5 diameter burr that will make a, 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 a initial penetration into cortical bone. Um, I, I don't use a round burr very often, you know, sometimes, but very, very rarely. Okay. Well, we're at right towards the bottom of the hour, and I want to give you a chance to give us some parting shots before we call it a night, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll say good night to everyone. So I'm turning yeah, it back I, to you. you know, I, I, I always appreciate your your kindness and your your uh, your ability to 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 help educate. Our, our colleagues, you know, I'm at this level of my career where I was blessed with great mentors and it's really nice to give back um, to the profession to some degree. Hope we got a couple little gems there. Um, obviously these webinars are not an end all, but rather to stimulate your thought and make you better practitioners. So we uh, wish everybody health and safety. Um, uh, I know here in Michigan, COVID's coming back. Um, we're getting cancellations from patients. So hopefully it won't be uh, as traumatic as it was before. So hopefully everybody stays safe and, and successful and hope to see um, see everybody soon. And Lauren, thank you for all you do for the profession. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Tim. As I mentioned at the top, you know, when we are marketing webinars and your name is on that invitation, we, that's always our best attended webinars. Um, you bring in a, a big crowd because uh, you always have great content. It's always new content. You're not like some of those speakers out there that just regurgitate the same slides over and over again. You showed a case today from, from a patient from today. Uh, we don't tend to see that very often in this industry. Um, so thank you for, for sharing your expertise with us. As always, thanks to Golden Dent. Uh, you see the code that's up there on, on the screen and their phone number. Uh, those deals are time limited. So I would certainly uh, you know, recommend that you take advantage of, of those deals. As Kurt had mentioned, it's not just about selling you forceps or bone graft or whatever. Uh, Golden Dent is really all about the education. And as Tim mentioned, it, you know, these webinars are designed to sort of whet your appetite a little bit, but going to some of these all day courses or weekend courses, uh, you're really going to get a, a full understanding of, of the techniques and all the little tips and tricks that, that you need. So I would certainly take advantage of that. Um, final reminder, the webinar was recorded. The recording should go out in the next few days. The CE certificates are handled by Golden Dent. Nothing you need to do on your end, no registration or quiz or anything like that. Golden Dent usually takes about a week or so to get those out. We had 900 plus people registered tonight. So keep an eye on your inbox, keep an eye on your junk folders because sometimes they end up there as well. 
and let me know within a week or so if you don't have it and I'll follow up with them. Um, final thanks is to all of you. Uh, we tend to get great turnout for these webinars. All of you who are here are on the list for future webinars. We do these on a regular basis, so please keep an eye out for, for upcoming webinars uh, with Golden Dent and, and other sponsors. Thank you all for joining us. Please stay safe and healthy out there, and we look forward to seeing all of you on our next webinar. Good night, everyone. Good night.